Thank, thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here at Hope Global Forums. We find that the research that we do, the Edelman Trust Barometer, so often aligns um, so closely to the issues that are going on in the world and often foretell those, um, the signal, or a foretelling signal to some of the things that we're seeing. And this year, when we got the financial services sector cut, of the Edelman Trust Barometer, I called John and I said, John, uh, we're saying the same thing. So, you know, let's, let's, pow let's power up on this. And so we were proud to have him join us when we launched the research in New York and then um, an honor to be here with you today. I always like to just kind of ask the crowd, how many of you have heard of the Edelman Trust Barometer? Just to get a sense of people's familiarity. Oh, great, great. So Edelman is uh, the world's largest communications firm. And we, for the last 19 years, have measured trust with the Edelman Trust Barometer. So the reason that we measure trust is because we believe that trust is a leading indicator. If you are trusted, people will buy your products. They'll defend you in a crisis. They will um, buy your stock, recommend you to a friend. And of course, the opposite things if they don't trust you. And so as we look at trust in the financial services sector, we find that every single conversation starts with trust. It, it, is, it is the full faith, and gut, full faith and credit of the American government that allows us to have trusts in banks. But as we were hearing sort of this conversation about the global financial crisis, that was just the latest crisis. Of course, the Great Depression, but even the very beginning of our banking system was a, the, a mass class divide between the Hamiltonians that believed in so, strong central banking run out of urban centers and the Jeffersonians believing that it was the egalitarian democratization that belonged to farmers. And so farmers and bankers pitted against each other for about the first hundred years of our financial system. So, but that is a backdrop and understanding that interconnectivity between government and business that has always been there. Let me get into a little bit of the detail of the trust barometer. Here we go. So the trust barometer is, as I said, um, 19 years of data. It's global research. It is launched every year at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And then about four months later, we get um, what we call the sector cuts, the reports on the different sectors that we cover globally at Edelman. Um, what you see here is uh, the blue solid triangle indicates when we're looking at general online population. But we also break it apart into informed public and mass population, because it is very interesting to see how those two populations view things differently. So informed public, well at least apparently at Edelman, we only believe that you're informed if you are between the ages of 25 and 64. Um, <laughs> you are, you're college educated, uh, you're in the top quartile of the income earners in your country, and you're telling us that you read a significant amount of business media. And that is um, against the comparison of the mass population, which is 84% of the population. As we look at the data globally in the financial services report, we pull out the five largest economies with those flags there at the bottom. That'll give you a sense where the US stands, how it stands against the other countries that we survey, but also um, these major money centers. What we saw this year is um, a real divide between informed public, which we'll see on that first horizontal bar, and general population there on the second. The blue bars up top, those blue bars are telling us that they are in the trusted category. So if you look at the icons, we're measuring trust in NGOs, business, government, and the media, because our belief is that those are the institutions that if they are trusted in your country, you are able to impact societal change, either for good or maybe not so good, but these are the, the central foundations of society. So then if you look there, so, so among, the public, among the informed public, NGOs are trusted, uh, business is trusted, but then if you look at the general population, they, they don't trust anyone, and they definitely don't trust government and business um, in the green. So you really start to see this pulling apart of who believes in what institutions. And the fundamental question in the survey is, do you believe in, let's say, business in your country to do the right thing? You'll see in those little bubbles the plus-ups, um, kind of where trust is, is increasing. What we looked um, here this year and found 
a real return to record highs between that first line, which is the informed public, in the blue boxes where they are trusting, and the mass population on the bottom line still distrusting in those green boxes um, straight across for the last uh, seven years. And what we see here in 2019 is a return to the highest gaps between trust of the informed public and distrust of the mass population, a 16-point gap. So that you see that these are two populations of society that really view things um, quite differently. We also looked at this um, by gender lines. And you see the biggest divide with women there on the first horizontal line and men on the bottom. You see that men in blue, they trust business. Um, women still distrusting. You are, in, you know, or at least in the neutral category. As you think about that, you can only hypothesize that we live in a world of equal pay issues, um, me too, not enough women in the C-suite, and maybe, you know, women are feeling left out by business. And those numbers are even bigger, larger in gap when you ask about financial services and financial services advice. So let's kind of dig into what inequality looks like as it relates to financial services specifically. If you look here at these sectors, these are all the sectors that we survey at Edelman. Financial services, while it has been on a steady rise and up eight points um, over the last five-year trend, still the least trusted sector. I was pretty pleased a couple of years ago to see that we had outpaced the cigarette manufacturers, and so I think we're on our way to um, a trusting category. And just to give you some context, we're there at the neutral category at 57 now. Trusted category is at 60, so it's sort of surprising to me and positive that we've been able to maintain a positive trajectory given you know, macroeconomic trends, political unrest, um, deregulation, as it may uh, not be a benefit to consumer, but people are still sort of hanging in there. Here we give you a view of all of the countries that we survey, and what this, what this slide is telling you between the blue bars of trust, the green bars of distrust, that the sector is not trusted in 15 of the 26 markets that we survey, and this is among mass population. But when you look at informed public, so it's really trusted. Now it's trusted in 16 out of the markets that we survey. So again, underscoring the divide between informed public and mass populations and how they feel about the sector. When we look then at innovations um, and how innovations are trusted, informed public, um, if you look there along the bottom row, you see cryptocurrency, robo-advisory, peer-to-peer. Um, and what's, this, I think, so important for this conversation that you guys, that we'll all be having together over the next few days as it relates to Pathways to Prosperity, is how are we finding innovations that are really making a difference in people's lives and in enabling them to more easily enter the financial system in a way that benefits them. As you see over to the right, in the blue bars, you have, um, you know, the, the trusted institutions. As I mentioned, the banks, Banks are trusted because they're backed by the government. Um, credit card companies have been good about sort of pulling fraudulent charges quickly without much argument um, off your cart. And then, of course, insurance, I think, is becoming better understood. And I think the products are becoming more innovative and more, re and more relevant to people. Here we look again at um, innovations uh, by men and women. So the gaps are still sort of in the favor of men that they're more trusting of these products. I think it's interesting to note that this is global data. When we had research in the field in just the US um, measuring trust among affluent millennials, these were millennials with $50,000 and more in investable assets, they told us that they trusted all these products, they were very much using these products, that 25% of them are holding cryptocurrency, and another 35% wish they were holding cryptocurrency. So I think that when you have a sound financial base, you're willing to be more open-minded and try new things to diversify your approach to financial services. 
So what is, what is being demanded of the sector? And this is where I think, this data I think really speaks to you in this room because I think you're, you're here to solve problems. And uh, this data is sort of pointing to the kind of problems that the financial services industry is expected to address. And so it's not super surprising that 73% of the world's population say, create products and technologies that make it easier for me to do business with you. And in, in, in financial services lingo, I think that means give me better customer experience. I want the same kind of customer experience that I'm getting for all my other tech-enabled products, and you are just another tech-enabled product to me. So I think that the industry needs to listen to that message and be smart about how we reach um, more and more of the population with products that are easier and more accessible and, 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 and just in language that is written in a more human uh, tone, quite frankly. But then I think it's also interesting that almost equal, 70% of those when asked about the financial services sector said they're absolutely expecting them to lead on social issues uh, that make this world a better place. Now, Three or four years ago at Edelman, we saw this number as uh, millennials and U.S. millennials leading on this drive, this call for business to improve social issues. And now it's um, absolutely a global phenomenon and it is, it is ageless. And so I think that as all of you, particularly coming from companies, think about what you're doing every day through your foundations and, and even the products that you're delivering, how you're paying off on this message that those types of products are helping to make the world a better place. Interestingly, um, as we asked folks to rank, what are the most important issues that the financial services industry needs to address? Income inequality at the very top, income inequality and financial security. And so I would say if you're in the financial services industry, you're working every day to promote financial security. But how much of that messaging is living at the heart of everything that you do and everything that you say? Because being trusted means to be that you are believed, that you are authentic, and that you are relevant when you are telling me that you're going to help me deliver financial security to my family, to my community, to my society, and my future. And this notion of um, leaders, uh, looking for leadership from the CEOs, 76, if you look in the quotations there, 76% of uh, respondents globally believe that CEOs should be taking on challenging issues, and 75% uh, that say that they trust their employer. And you can imagine uh, how delighted we were to see Jamie Dimon including this Edelman Trust Barometer in his annual letter this year as we really see CEOs taking up the conversation on um, trust. You see Larry Fink at BlackRock, the CEO of Charles Schwab says we're not in the financial services industry, we're in the trust business. And I think people really understand that trust is at the heart of having a meaningful engagement with, um, with your consumers in the financial services business. When we ask, so what are the issues you think financial services industry is really going to be able to address uh, in terms of being able to, to remedy income inequality, or at least you know, make an impact, and equal pay, um, prejudice and discrimination, also training for the jobs of tomorrow. Last year's data told us that the number one things people were fearful was, of was automation taking their jobs away. So what are we doing about reskilling? And how can we show our employees and our communities that we really care about the humans that run our business by helping to continually train them and, and really sort of invest in their future as well? And for a long time now, we've seen that profits are not an excuse, that companies are absolutely expected to make the world a better place while turning a profit. You're more credible when you're doing societal good, when it's something that you're built to do, something that you're particularly good at. One of my favorite examples is um, you, the UBS Oncology Fund. So if you're a high net worth individual and you want to be part of curing cancer, you can invest in the UBS Oncology Fund. They're going to make money. They're investing in oncology drugs. And you feel like your money is going to something more than just financial gain. So I think there's interesting innovations out there um, relating to helping employees reti retire student debt and some innovative products that, that lenders are actually out there doing and offering as, as employee benefits that are enabling companies to recruit 
top talent because student debt is such a concern in the country. So how are we doing what we're really good at to solve the problems that need to be solved? And I think it's important that every year we dig a little deeper into an issue that we can see bubbling up in a couple years' data. And the notion of inclusion has become more and more evident as we see the populist movement pull apart, as we see the high net worth individuals and affluent millennials, particularly um, great in savings and 401ks and 529s and retirement funds and emergency funds, but just that little tick under and you get to half the population that can't afford a $400 emergency. Like That's a problem and that's a problem for society. So how do we as an industry innovate for inclusion? And so it's not surprising to me that when we ask what are the most important innovations the industry should be focused on, that they want to see this integration of all financial aspects of my life. We even saw some, some early signs of that from the winners of the, award, of the award many earlier and thinking very integrated and inclusive about how to make technology work harder for you. Um, certainly AI and digital platforms are important, but also peer-to-peer -peer payments and, um, and again, cryptocurrencies. I go to a lot of financial technology conferences and I think Despite what you see in the headlines, people really say um, it's early days for crypto, don't count it out. So we'll see. When we ask what's the most important innovation that's going to make the system work for everyone, it's not surprising that people, the number one answer is keep my data safe. Um, but then when you get sort of one tick below that, fair access to credit, financial inclusions for the un and underbanked, financial literacy, even through digital gaming amplification. I'm so inspired when I hear John talk about the work that they do around helping people understand how to raise their FICO scores and understand how to you know, rid payday lending from their lives so that they don't get in these terrible traps. And just having, having that knowledge um, and knowing how to go and where to go, I think we're hearing some very interesting conversations happening about how to do that even faster. So for a while now, we've known that financial, of all the sectors that we survey, financial services is the least trusted, right? But when we ask the employees, of the, when we ask the people that we surveyed, how much do you entrust your employer to do the right thing? It is the employees of financial services companies that trust their employer to do the right thing more than anything, any, anyone else we survey. And I think that's important. Um, and you break it down a little bit, it doesn't matter if it's mass population or informed public. This is kind of the only place that they agree on things. It doesn't matter if it's men or women. It's an ubiquitous feeling that my company, that my financial services employer, is there to do the right thing. And it might be that they're trying to defend their companies um, coming out of the crisis and sort of saying, these are good people I work for and we really do care about our communities and we really do have important products. But I think the message to all of you um, especially, you know, big employers, is how are you using your employees as this massive army of brand ambassadors that are very eager to participate in your platforms, uh, participate in your purpose programs, and are really, you know, hungry to. So when you, when you engage them in this way, what can you expect back? Advocacy, loyalty, engagement, commitment. I mean, these are all things that we want to inspire in employees. And so, if we look across this, what we're calling the new employer-employee contract, it is interesting to me to think about, we know income inequality and financial inclusion need to be addressed by the industry. We know that our employees are very, trust us, and are very eager to participate in our platforms. We know that CEOs are expected to lead from the front foot and integrate all of this, and also that it's local. Um, no matter how large you are, how global you are, we're all sort of local at the end of the day, and that's where we want to come together and participate. And so um, we hope as you go through the next few days, you, you're able to think about sort of trust in the sector as a backdrop to how the industry is really going to be trusted enough to make a real impact and get more people in the system so that we can improve the society and, and the quality of life for, for everyone. So thank you.